Hello everyone and welcome to this Ananuga meetup. My name is Odmin Bakke and together with Henrik Valkemo will be your host for this evening. For the ones that are new to the group, welcome! And here's a little bit about us. We are part of the .NET Foundation and we are an independent user group with focus on .NET. We tend to focus on talks and subjects based on practical experience and it's by developers for developers. Also, always interested in people that have something to present. If you have something you would like to present, please contact us either by email or by Twitter. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel and the Twitch channel. We are also looking for new board members now. If you are interested, then please send an email to oslo at nvunge.no before December ends. We would also like to thank our sponsor. Without them, this meetup would not be possible to arrange on a regular basis. The NNUG board consists of these people. These are the ones that organizes the meetups and please contact any of us if you have any questions or comments. And again, we are looking for new board members now. I would also remind you about Microsoft Learn. Here you can complete free learning modules for .NET. And you can also get a digital badge by visiting the link on the screen. Also, of the ones asking the best technical questions during the talk, we will draw a winner of a Microsoft backpack. Today we are so lucky to have David Christiansen and Davis Murchenkals here to talk about impotency in distributed systems and .NET memory dumps. The presentation will start soon, and there will be a Q&A session after each session. Please ask questions during the talk and the QA for the Q&A afterwards. So without further ado, I give the word over to David. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Shall we? Wait three more minutes before we start, or shall we roll? You can just start now if you want. Yes, then let's get the screen share rolling. Hello. And can we? See. There we go. Perfect. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is David Christensen. I'm a consultant at Forsha. We're a small consultancy with the office over in Lysaker. We're primarily doing .NET consultancy. And for the last well, four years now, almost, I have been working at IF, um, at the, uh, mostly in the communication team in Waypoint. And today, Today's topic is idempotency. Just a quick disclaimer. Um, I will be touching on a host of different um, subjects and most of them will, they are a lot com more complicated and I will do a bit of hand waving and glossing over a lot of finer points. Um, so bear with me. Um, so without further ado, um, idempotency and why it's important for distributed systems. Um, a distributed system is per definition, the moment you have more than two applications or two processors talking to each other on different machines. You can even make an argument that having two different um, system or things working on the same processor or the same physical machine are distributed system depends a bit on the setup um but so what that basically boils down to is that pretty much all you're doing in modern computer the like what we're doing in a day-to-day -day basis developing applications are distributed systems be that if we do messaging, HTTP, 
asynchronous communication, Kafka and service bus, you name it. We're communicating. One application is sending some sort of message to another, getting a response back, all distributed systems. That brings us to the interesting part about this and where distributed systems sort of come a bit more complicated. And that's the moment we're talking about message delivery. And in the terms of message delivery, we're having three sorts of messaging guarantees. And this is basic sort of computer science. We're having three delivery guarantees at least once, at most once, or exactly once. And which messaging style you're using is in a way very much determined by the message broker you're using. However, all of these have implications in terms of scalability. Exactly once is the easiest to reason about but it's also the least scalable. Um, to have exactly once delivery guarantees, you're pretty much forcing yourself to be on the same machine, having some sort of distributed transaction or acknowledgements of messaging being received and like TCP style, but messaging and distributed. It, it's, there is some overhead with this. Um, at least once, Fire and forget, that's obviously the easiest to implement, the easiest to get to scale to um, a large audience. Um, however, for most business application, maybe or maybe not uh, receiving an order is usually not good enough, which ends up being that, that what we're in most scenarios are dealing with is the at um, um, no sorry at least once delivery so at most once fire and forget at least once is yeah we will deliver this and I will keep delivering this until someone acknowledges that they have received this message that's basically what you're seeing in um, in a service bus for instance with with topics or messaging if we were looking at um, service bus implementations you're actually under the hood. You're, the message will be on the queue until you have confirmed to the queue that I have processed this message. There are, however, some implications of that. And the implications are, of course, that messages can come multiple times. And messages might also come out of order because someone rerun something or the process, lock the message for a long time, and so on. Um, and that brings us to the sort of the, the core of our talk, meaning that distributed systems are by their very nature eventually consistent. You might not always think of them as eventually consistent because in, in the frame of your application, yeah, I, I write to the database, everything is fine. There, there is no intermediate state. But again, we're pretty much all you're doing is a distributed system and a distributed system will always be eventually consistent, will be my statement of fact. And one of the hardest things about distributed systems is reasoning about state. Um, and reasoning about state in an eventual consistent system is tricky. And it's, I'm not saying it's supposed to be tricky. Um, oops, my slide. Um, but state is what matters in our system. If you're asking a business person, like, did, did we build this or not? 
he, he's asking about state in the database. He, he's asking if we emailed the invoice to the customer. He's asking about, did we actually get money from the customer? So state is important in, a, in, in all systems, and it's, but it's also complicated in a distributed systems because we are by nature eventually consistent. And then our good old friend Murphy will strike whenever we least expect him to strike. And my point with all of these things is that this brings us to item potency. And item potency is basically the property that if I run a message a thousand times, I will only apply that message once. So if I run the command to say, hey, generate an invoice a thousand times, the customer only gets one invoice. Um, and item potency in, in that way is a, becomes a very interesting property because if we're thinking about the scenario where I can get duplicate messages, I can get messages in the wrong order. If I apply this message now, or if I apply it in five minutes or in five hours, the state in my application after I have applied that message should be the same. And hence, item potency becomes a tool in our toolbox for which we can manage state. And again, in our development, managing state is, is the say all be all of, of what we do. Then some more underlying fu functions, transactions, you're all familiar with transactions. A transaction is basically an operation must either succeed or fail as a complete unit. However, having transactions in a distributed system is hard. Yes, you can use distributed transactions, but please don't. Um, if you are in the story position that your the application you are maintaining are using distributed transactions, I am there myself and I feel sorry for you. You have my deepest sympathies. I would very much argue that this getting rid of the distributed transactions should be on your, if not on the top priority, at least on your radar for something you eventually will have to deal with. So that all out of the way, item potency is always directly tied to your data store. And the reason for it always being tied to your data store is again, it's a tool in the toolbox for managing state. In a SQL database, um, you can start a transaction with spanning multiple tables, um, locks, rollbacks, all that works. No SQL databases are a bit differently and depending a bit on, on which SQL, no SQL implementation you're using, they're working a bit differently, but very generally speaking, you're only getting guarantees if you're doing something on a single document. Um, and that then becomes important because the moment you're doing, the way you're designing your operations must then consider, okay, if I have a NoSQL store, if my operation has shall have any chance of guaranteeing being item potent, it can only modify a single document in my uh, database. Um, let's not spend too much time considering other um, data providers. If you don't have any sort of transactional support um, in in your data store item potency becomes a theoretical exercise and has 
little practical value. And let's be honest, what we're doing here is, is looking at the practical approach. Um, so all of this sort of leads us to, well, how should we use item potency? And I, I, I will take sort of the, the item potency approach for, for messages here. Um, but a message could also be an HTTP call with some sort of key. Um, but you need like your messages, if you're trying to design an, an system that has item potent properties or is item potent, optimally seen, you need unique keys. GUIDs are good. Database keys are also perfectly fine. Um, again, it's the key needs to be unique and you, the key needs to be stored in the database or come from the database, maybe even optimally. Um, and, and you need to very much consider doing one thing at the time. Because again, we're, the goal is to have an eventually consistent state. And that means that all individual steps need to be item potent. Um, which also then means that the amount of things you can do, the amount of writes you can do in a single um, message handling or a, a single operation needs to, yeah, there, there's limits to how much you can do. And that, and again, if you need to do more complex things than like in service plus sagas or like a saga like pattern is, is probably the thing you're looking for. Um, if we're talking CRUD operations, a read should really, really, really be item potent. If your reads are not item potent, you're doing something wrong. Um, creates needs to be deterministic. Um, the best way of doing that is again, probably specifying the key in the request and making sure that the key is always present in the request so that then it's much easier to reason about, do I have this data in my data store already? And preferably have the data store throw some sort of exception if you're trying to insert it again. Um, updates is actually one of the most tricky thing to make um, item potent, um, especially the moment you're considering out of order deliveries and sort of reasoning about should I actually apply this update or not? Or, and there are a couple of techniques you can use um, to do this, like either fetching all the data. If you're updating a downstream system, you could treat a message for an update as a, I'm just going to fetch the, the data from the source and then overwrite everything because I, I just need to be in sync with the upstream system. Um, or you can do the um, event sourcing um, variant where you basically say, okay, I got a new event. It has some sort of logical number or logical ordering. And please don't use time for logical ordering. That's a accident waiting to happen or a headache waiting to happen. Um, and then just simply, okay, I got a new update. I'll just replay this with the new and that's my new final state. Um, there are others. Um, and then, yeah, the delete, deleting twice should be fine. The only thing you then need to be consider is what happens if I have a delete and then something has recreated and then I delete it again. Um, that means that your create process maybe needs to be different or, yeah, there's minor pitfalls to fall into, but it it's, Deletes are usually the easiest to reason about. Um, so thus, I'll just touch briefly on this. Um, it's 
think of sagas as some sort of an orchestrating mechanism where the saga itself doesn't really um, modify any state other than its own internal state. It will pretty much just say, okay, I am organizing this process. This process consists of these five or 16 or eight steps, uh, and I will fire them off in order and then wait for a reply from the other, um, from the system or subsystem or sub process executing that. Um, and if something fails, I might even um, take actions to undo the previous steps. Um, but the point of a saga is more that once a saga is completed, you should preferably be in a consistent state um, within your application and just say, okay, this entire process has now succeeded. And it's again, it's about having a complete um, thing happen. Every, it, it's about replicating the transaction. It's either everything happens or everything doesn't happen. And again, in those scenarios, having item potency can be very nice because, okay, I this the second message failed. That's fine. I will just rerun the second message. The service was down. Well, then the message will be on the queue, or I can retry whenever the and continue where I left off at some point. Um, and it it's it's a nice place to be and makes reasoning about processes even in a distributed system a lot easier to deal with. However, that being said, getting there and actually managing to get everything to be item potent, that's a um, more tricky engineering challenge. If you think you are item potent, you need to bloody well test and verify that you are item potent because thinking you're item potent and being item potent are two very distinct things. And I don't, I can't count the a number of times I thought I was creating an item potent system and or an item potent messaging handler service, whatever. And then Reed Murphy came, you're not. And frankly, the best way of testing is, is just be the chaos monkey. Generate the thousand duplicate messages, send them in the wrong order on purpose. Maybe even better, send them in random orders if you can. Whatever you think can go wrong, try making it go wrong and see what happens. Which brings us to the next question, uh, next topic, which is monitoring. Monitoring is hard. Monitoring a different as distributed system is even harder. Reasoning about state without the monitoring is bloody awful. So you need to look. You need to have, preferably, you have some sort of correlation IDs that get fed into your log that that are being kept track of so that you can see what went wrong. You can see where, okay, this message A got fine, message B got fine, message C is missing. Why is message C missing? Is it on the error queue? Did it get lost? Did it get eaten by Murphy? Who knows? But it, it's, you need to monitor and you need to have thought about how you're going to monitor processes up front. Um, and and that's that's really a key thing here. Um, to to get this to work in real life, you need to monitor and you need to have thought up front how am I going to monitor this system as a whole. And that goes to, and, and let, me, let me rephrase it, monitoring your system is important regardless if you're trying to be item potent or not. But monitoring, if you're trying to be item potent, if you're 
breaking up systems in smaller pieces and having those individual steps the moment the more decoupled things are the more important it is to monitor but also the harder it is to monitor and that life gets easier if you have thought about it a little bit up front um i have touched about this so let's not spend too much time i will say item potency is something you need to consider and plan for upfront. Retrofitting item potency is, if not impossible, it's impractical in most uh, scenarios. And most likely if you're trying to really implement item potency, you're either going to end up in a halfway state or, or you're in reality redesigning and re-implementing your system. Um, but if you really want to try, then the process is in a way straightforward. You break it down into the individual steps and then see, okay, this step here, is that this step item potent? Can I make it item potent? Um, can I, can I change it to be item potent? How do I need to change it to be item potent? What keys can I use to make it item potent? Do I have some natural keys or do I need to artificially introduce some keys? Maybe you um, need to introduce a, a new field in your database with a unique constraint on it. Um, so again, I would rec highly recommend you thinking about item potency upfront and, um, and trying to design for it upfront because retrofitting is, So yeah, in brief summary, the goal of item potency is again, if I call this endpoint one time or a thousand times, I should end up in the same state. If I send this message once or a thousand times, or even if I send it a thousand times, then send a thousand other messages and then the same message a thousand times, I shall end up in the same state. And the point of all of this, which is the key takeaway item potency is one of the tools for you to manage state in a distributed system and it's a powerful tool and a tool i can highly recommend you to apply whenever you're designing your next um, distributed systems so with that thank you all for listening So, yeah. Oh, hi, uh, David. Thanks for yes. a good talk. Uh, I don't see any comments uh, yet, but I had a question, so I'll just fire away. Um, Please. There are probably a lot of customers, uh, this talk customers, uh, wanting to at some point migrate away from that into something else. And uh, you say, um, be careful about distributed transactions. And yet we also see Sargas here. Um, do you see Sargas as a way of sort of moving the orchestrations out of BizTalk and doing the same, but with Sargas? Or how would you approach um, that sort of a problem? Okay, I'm, I will admit I'm not intimately familiar with, um, with um, BizTalk, but the Let's think just how to rephrase. So most of the times, the moment we're talk, sort of breaking up a monolith, we're doing it for scale, either for team scalability or for performance scalability. Um, and that means that you're, what you're sort of asking is for having different parts of the system having being responsible for different parts of the process. So you're breaking down your process. And, um, but the, the moment you're breaking down your process, you then need something to 
still orchestrate that process or that the, the process still exists. Something needs to own that process and something needs to make sure that every sub piece of the process or like every step in the process gets um, gets resolved or get gets applied. Uh, and for that, Sagas is is one of the tools you can use and and is is working fairly nice. Um, again, I, I have mostly experience with the end service bus implementation of Sagas, um, and and I would assume most of you have, or if you're looking into it, the end service bus implementation is is perfectly fine. I don't recommend you making your own Saga implementation. Um, that's a that's a separate engineering challenge, um, but yeah, and 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 it's it's just about so yeah. It, it, but again, like the, the hard part is not implementing a saga in in the end service bus or in any other way. The the what you need to think about if you want to migrate from one process to another process where you're sort of saying that yeah, my this transaction which is. I, really just a set of, of processes. If I break them down into individual pieces, where is, if this piece goes fine, okay, can I make that piece item potent? Okay, and maybe I can't, or if that piece fails, but this piece went okay, what do I do then? Do I roll back the previous piece? In what time frame do I need to roll back the previous piece? Can I roll back the previous piece? And and it's it's just it's about breaking down the process, and that that's the hard part about this is breaking down the processes. Um, but I what my recommendation is that if you start breaking down your process and you're starting to try and rec um, replicate what is currently a distributed transaction, then having your individual pieces of the puzzle being idempotent will make the reasoning about if this entire process is now broken down a lot easier. Yeah, so a good answer there. I think the short summary is uh, that there are no easy solutions, but uh, definitely <laughs> worth than going the idempotent way uh, still. With that, I think there are no other um, comments. So I'll say uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you.